Okay, so thank you for uh, the invitation. So this was work uh, uh, in collaboration with uh, Nader Masmoudi. And uh, uh, let me explain, first of all, uh, the motivations. So the general goal is to study stability of stationary resolution, call it uh, H, of a nonlinear wave equation in dimension one. So let me take uh, an example as indicated on, on the slide. Take simply the function e identically equal to zero, which is a stationary resolution of uh, the nonlinear Clendron equation dt squared minus dx squared plus one u equals a nonlinearity and n of u vanishing at least at order two at zero. So in this case, uh, studying the stability of the zero solution just means studying the behavior of solutions corresponding to small initial data in a convenient space of smooth and decaying functions. And uh, then it is uh, well known uh, that uh, the solution of such a problem uh, behaves in an infinity norm like uh, epsilon t to the minus one half when t goes to infinity. So this has been proved by Lynn Batsofer, uh, myself, Stingo. And this tells you that not only actually uh, the solution corresponding to small data remains small, but it tells you also that the solution decays when time goes to infinity. So what we're interested in is perturbation of uh, a non-zero solution, namely the so-called kink. So this is a function capital H of X given by the public tangent of x over square root of two. So this function is a stationary resolution of the so-called FIFO model, which is uh, the nonlinear wave equation in one space dimension written below, dt squared minus d squared phi equals phi minus phi to the cube. And we would like to know if uh, taking for phi a small perturbation of h, uh, the solution will uh, remain small for a long time and eventually it will even decay to zero. So in other words, we uh, want to study solutions of that equation that may be written as the sum of the stationary solution H of X plus a perturbation denoted by small phi of this root of two, the X root of two. So if you plug this decomposition inside uh, the equation, uh, you get for small phi uh, a new equation, uh, which is a, a nonlinear Klingon equation with potential. More precisely, denoting by capital DT one over one over I D over DT, the equation satisfied by small phi reads capital DT square minus D square plus one plus a potential to V of X acting on phi equals a nonlinearity involving a quadratic and a cubic term. So the potential here is uh, known explicitly. This is a function exponentially decaying in particular in S of R. And uh, in the right hand side in front of the quadratic part you have uh, kappa of x uh, coefficient depending on x, which does not decrease, uh, it goes to different limits are plus or minus infinity. So what are the known results for this problem? Well, the orbital stability of H has been proved by Henry Perez and Radzinski. So it tells you that if you take uh, initially the perturbation phi to be small, then the solution, small phi, will remain small uh, up to eventually some uh, symmetries of the equation for any time. It does not tell you if this perturbation will go to zero when time goes to infinity. This is the so-called asymptotic stability. And this asymptotic stability has been established by Kowalczyk, Martel, and Munoz uh, locally in space. So let me state the result 
they got. In order to do so, I have to introduce some uh, notation. In uh, the Kleinon equation with potential that I mentioned on the preceding slide, we had uh, an operator minus dx squared plus 2v of x, uh, which, uh, which is well known. And in particular, it is known that this operator has uh, zero plus infinity as absolutely continuous spectrum and that it has two negative eigenvalues, minus one and minus one over four. And uh, from now on, I shall restrict myself to the framework considered by Kovacic, Martel, and Munoz. Namely, I shall consider only odd perturbations, small phi of the kink. If you do that, you see immediately that only the eigenvalue minus one over four will play a role because minus one is associated to some even eigenfunction. And so when you restrict your problem to all solutions, this eigenvalue may be discarded. So everything happens like if you had only the absolute continuous spectrum and eigenvalue minus one over four for this operator. And so now what you do is that you decompose uh, your perturbation small phi as its projection on the absolute continuous spectrum that I call E1 plus its projection on the eigenspace associated to the eigenvalue minus one over four, which is given by some coefficient Z1 of T depending only on time multiplied by y of x, where y is a normalized, a normalized eigenfunction associated to the eigenvalue minus one over four. So you may decompose in the same way in dt phi as u2 plus z2y. And now you may state the theorem of Kovalchik, Martel, and Munoz. So this theorem tells you that if you take your initial data to be small enough in the energy space, h dot one times L2 and odd, then uh, small phi will uh, decay in time in an integral sense. That is, you will know that the zj of t belong to L4 in time and you will know that if you take the density of energy, dx u1 square plus u1 square plus u2 square, which is a function of t n of x, if you multiply it by an exponential decaying weight, and if you integrate in space and time, this is again smaller than infinity, which is also a way to express some uh, integral uh, time decay. So now let me make more comments on uh, this uh, estimate, in particular, the second one, uh, showing you a picture. So this estimate is an estimate which is actually local in space because of this red uh, exponential decaying uh, weight. This inequality tells you something in the shaded area in the picture above in this uh, vertical uh, strip. Uh, it does not tell you much outside this strip. And uh, this is exactly the problem that we want to address. Namely, we would like to obtain uh, decay, say dispersive estimates, not when X is in a compact set, but when X may go to plus or minus infinity. And it turns out that we shall be able to do that, not for all times, but only up to the time epsilon to the minus four, where epsilon will be the size of the Cauchy data. As I shall explain later on, we expect that past this time, new phenomena will happen along, two, uh, dot, dot it along these two red dotted lines so that we do not expect uh, uh, the same type of estimates uh, as the ones we shall get to be, uh, uh, to be true without modification past this time. 
So now let me state precisely our main theorem. So recall that we're interested in uh, all perturbations of uh, our kink and that these all perturbations solve a nonlinear Kleindon equation with a potential to V of X and also with some uh, coefficient kappa of X in the nonlinearity. So let me do what I did uh, just before. That, me, that is, let me decompose phi as its projection on the absolutely continuous spectrum plus its projection on the eigenspace associated to the unique eigenvalue that matters minus one over four. So in other words, the second term will be A of T, a function depending only on, on time, times Y which is the uh, which is a normalized eigenfunction associated to the eigenvalue. So in other words, a of t is a the L2 scalar product of phi and y. So now you plug in equation E this decomposition and you project moreover the equation on the two uh, relevant subspaces. When you project equation E on uh, the eigenvalue associated to the unique eigenvalue, you will get an ODE for the coefficient A of t. The ODE, capital T square minus square over four A of t, equals the projection on the eigenspace associated to the eigenvalue minus one over four of the nonlinearity. In the same way, if you apply the projector PAC on the equation E. Well, you get uh, the same equation, but acting on PAC phi, which will be equal to a PAC of the right-hand side of your equation. And so now we shall uh, uh, try to solve equation E or system S Taking initial data t equals one instead of t equals zero, this is just to, to simplify some notation. And we shall assume that the initial data are smooth enough, small enough, and have some decay. So we express this saying that at the initial time t equals one, the phi should be equal to epsilon phi zero, dt phi to epsilon phi one, where epsilon will be a small number, where phi zero phi one will be smooth enough. We express that assuming they, that they belong respectively to HS plus one and HS for some S large enough and uh, stay bounded in these spaces. And moreover, we assume some decay imposing that X phase phi zero is in H one and X phi one is in L2. And then we have the following theorem. So do not read the first four lines of the statement. This is just a way to repeat uh, what I have just said in uh, uh, a more formal way. So the theorem actually says the following. It tells you that under this smoothness, decay, and smallness assumptions, then if your time t is limited to the interval one epsilon to the minus four plus of any small positive constant, then you have the decay estimates you look for. So first of all, the solution A of t of the OD may be written as the products of an oscillatory factor and of terms G plus or G minus, where these terms decay, they are bounded from above by uh, epsilon over square root of one plus T epsilon square. So in other words, A of T decays essentially like T to the minus one half. And if you take a time derivative, you gain an extra T to the minus one half decay. 
And now concerning the dispersive part, that is the projection of the solution on the absolutely continuous spectrum, you get that it's L infinity norm, decays also like T to the minus one half, but multiplied by some factor, epsilon square square root of T power some theta prime. So this factor being small when T stays small than epsilon to the minus four, but getting worse when T is close to epsilon to the minus four, and this explains why we are limited to such a, uh, a time interval. And finally, if we multiply PAC phi by some decaying weight, then we may improve the above bounds, replacing to t to the minus one half by t to the minus three over four. So let me mention that uh, up to time epsilon to the minus four, this uh, solves exactly the problem we wanted. Namely, this gives us for the solution uh, decay, which holds true not just for x in some compact set, but for x going up to plus or minus infinity, because here we have an L infinity bound. So let me make also some comments about this epsilon to the minus four limitation. Actually, uh, we do not believe that when t is lower than epsilon to the minus four, you may obtain uh, an elimity bound in t to the minus one half. I would expect nothing better than a bound in log t over a square root of t. So this conjecture is uh, supported by some recent work of Lindblad, Luhrmann, and Sofer that have studied that studied a, a Kleinron equation with that potential, dt squared plus x squared plus one phi equals uh, a sum of a quadratic and of cubic nonlinearity. And for these equations, they have proved that under convenient assumptions, of course, the solution phi does behave like log t over square root of t along two half lines of space time which are similar to the dotted red lines that I have shown you precedingly. So the phenomenon that provokes that is not exactly the same as the one that we uh, encounter in our work, but I guess that this is uh, uh, related. Let me also recall you that in June, I guess, uh, Fabio Pusateri gave in this seminar a talk about uh, a joint work with uh, Pierre Germain where they have studied a Kleinon equation with potential of the same type as the one we consider here, uh, equal to a nonlinearity with the coefficients depending on x, uh, in the case when the potential has no bound states, so in particular, no, no eigenvalue. And so in this case, they proved that the solution as an infinity bound in epsilon t to the minus one half, the same that holds true for solutions, for instance, of a Kleinon equation with small initial data. And so again, here you have something which goes up to time equals plus infinity, and with a, a factor epsilon, which is better than the one we get in the case of our system with a bound state. Let me also say that our bounds. Uh, uh, imply the integral bounds of uh, Kovalchik, uh, uh, Martel, and Mios uh, up to the time epsilon to the minus four, uh, to which we are able to, to prove them. So, before trying to give an idea on the proof of the theorem, let me discuss briefly the simplest, the simple case of the nonlinear triangle equation with small data. And actually, let me take uh, even a simpler equation. Let me uh, define P of Xi as a function square root of one plus Xi square. And let me take a half Klagenon equation, namely capital DT minus P of capital DXU 
equals the simple cubic nonlinearity modulus of u square u. And imagine we want to prove for the solution of such an equation with small uh, initial data, uh, the dispersive estimate uh, u at time t null infinity bounded from above by epsilon over square root of t. So it is well known that if you want to prove such an estimate, actually you have to prove uh, also at the same time two other estimates that all together will uh, say propagate up to uh, time infinity. So the other two estimates you need are first of all a Sobolev estimate saying that the Sobolev norm of u uh, is O of uh, epsilon t to the delta, delta being a small positive power and s being large enough. And you need also an L2 estimate, which tells you that if you make act on U, the operator L plus, which is defined above as X plus T P prime of DX, then L plus U as L2 norm, uh, uh, bounded from above also by epsilon T to delta for small delta. And then the way you use these estimates is through a bootstrap argument. You assume that this set EA of estimates with this constant A holds true on some time interval 1t. And you show that if delta is small enough, if S is large enough, if epsilon is small enough, if the constant A has been taken large enough, if you use the equation and essentially plug in the equation, uh, this estimates EA, then you may prove that EA over two, the same estimate, but with A replaced by A over two, still hold on the same interval one T. And so if you have done that, then this implies that the initial set of estimates EA actually holds true on a slightly larger interval. And then you may push a capital T up to infinity. And let me just say a word about the proof of the middle, the improvement of the middle estimate. So actually what you do is that you use that the operator L plus that you have introduced commutes to the linear part of the equation dt minus of dx. So if you apply L plus to your cubic equation, you will get that dt minus p of dx L plus u is equal to L plus on the right hand side. It turns out that the right hand side has a, a nice structure so that L plus uh, behaves like a derivation. And so you have a, a Leibniz rule, which tells you that the L2 norm of this right hand side is bounded from above by L, the L2 norm of u to the square times the L2 norm of L plus u. And so if you plug inside, if you write next the energy inequality associated to this, to this public system and plug in it uh, the a priori estimates EA and tune conveniently the constants, you show that EA over two well, the second equation in EA over two holds true. So I recall that because this is essentially, uh, this, is, this, is, uh, this equation is essentially the one to which we would like to reduce our problem. So let me try to explain that. So recall that we are studying a system involving an ODE and the PDE. The PDE being this uh, non-linear triangle equation that I, I, I wrote here on the second line. And our idea will be to try to reduce this equation to uh, the equation uh, we have considered on the preceding slide. So in particular, we would want to get rid of this potential V of X 
because we have seen that it was important to obtain these inequalities to be able to commute some operator L plus to the linear part of the equation. And such an L plus uh, does not commute well to V of X. So the first step in our proof will be to get rid of the potential through conjugation by wave operators. So let me recall this uh, standard argument. Call capital A, the operator we have been considering, uh, minus one half of d squared plus u of x. And call capital A zero, minus one half of d squared. So recall that one defines the wave operator, w plus, as the strong limit when t goes to plus infinity of e to the i t a times e to the minus i t a zero. And one knows that uh, this limit exists and that the operator W plus defined in that way has the following property. If you compose uh, our operator dx squared plus two v of x by W plus star on the left, and by the spectral projector on the absolutely continuous spectrum at the right, then we just get d square w plus tau pc. In other words, the commutation of w plus tau to the operator with the potential eliminates the potential. And so if we define a new unknown w, that will be W plus star PAC phi. Then we see that if we apply this W plus star to the left hand side and the right hand side of our equation, because of this uh, intertwining property, this will eliminate the potential and give us a linear part given by dt square minus d square plus one of the new unknown W equals uh, W plus star of the right hand side. So of course we, we, have a pay, we have to pay a price for that, which is the fact that uh, the right hand side will become more complicated. Actually, it turns out using in particular the fact that we are always dealing with uh, odd functions, that this uh, operator acting on uh, the right hand side may be expressed uh, in terms of uh, a pseudo differential operator b of x dx b of x xi being uh, a pseudo differential symbol of order zero uh, which moreover decays in space when x goes to infinity if you take at least one derivative and so in the right hand side we have now a non-local expression because of this b of x dx, b of x dx star. But except that we still have a quadratic and a cubic contribution. These contributions uh, being uh, expressed in terms of, uh, uh, well, w and uh, a of t, the solution of uh, the ODE that was, that was coupled with the PD we are studying. So we shall uh, reduce again the equation by transforming this second order scalar equation to a first order system. So let me call u plus or minus capital D t plus or minus p of dx w, where p of dx is again square root of one plus dx square. And let me rewrite this equation as a system on u plus and u minus. So I shall write only the equation on u plus because the one of u minus is obtained by, by conjugation. And before showing you this system, uh, let me just make a, a comment. So here in the right hand side of our new equation, if we develop the square for instance, we shall get on the one hand terms uh, like a of t y to the square, terms independent of w. I shall call these terms source terms. 
we shall get uh, uh, linear terms in W coming from the double product. We shall get quadratic terms in W and also cubic terms in W. So let me summarize this in uh, this slide saying that dt minus p of dx of our new unknown u plus is given by the following type of terms. So the source terms that do not, inv uh, that do not involve u plus which are given by a of t to the square of a of t to the q multiplied by some functions that belong to s of r functions that decay at infinity. Then, as already remarked, we have linear terms in u plus or its conjugate u plus bar. So these linear terms being given by a of t times uh, some linear form in u plus u plus bar, which has coefficients depending on x. And it turns out that these coefficients are functions of x which decay when x goes to infinity. These coefficients belong to S of R. Next, we have quadratic terms, uh, q2 of x, u plus, u plus bar, which are quadratic in u plus and u plus bar, which are also coefficients depending on, on x, but these coefficients uh, do not decay. They go to non-zero limits at infinity. It's only the derivatives that belong to S of R. And finally, we have cubic terms that have the same structure. So of course, there are also some other terms that I did not write because uh, the ones that I wrote are the worst ones in some way. And moreover, uh, one should forget that in this uh, Q prime one, Q two, Q two three, uh, the nonlinear keys are given through non-local operators, but this is not uh, an essential extra difficulty. So it turns out that the worst term above is uh, Q2. And so the first thing we want to do is to eliminate this Q2 uh, through a time normal form a la chata. So this just means the following. This means that one tries to find a new quadratic form Q tilde two, such that if you subtract this Q tilde two of u plus u bar plus to u plus in the left hand side, and you compute dt minus p of dx of this quantity, you will get essentially the same terms uh, as above, except the quadratic one. So of course, the cubic term, for instance, will be modified, but it will, be, it will uh, keep the same structure. And you will have uh, eliminated the quadratic term. So this would be possible, actually, if Q2 were independent of X. But since you have a Q2 that depends of X, when you apply this uh, time normal form method, you generate some uh, some commutators essentially, so that you do not fully eliminate Q2, but you replace it by a Q prime two that is still quadratic, but which has now coefficients which decay when X goes to infinity, like in Q prime one. And it turns out that uh, in particular, because we are dealing only with odd solutions, expressions which have decaying coefficients enjoy better time decay properties than expressions with uh, constant coefficients. So let me rewrite the equation. If we subtract this Q tilde plus from U plus in the left hand side, we have the same structure for the right hand side, except that now the quadratic part has been replaced by some new Q prime two, uh, 
where this u prime two has coefficients that uh, decay when x goes to infinity, which is uh, an improvement for uh, the problem we want to study. So at the end of the second step, we have thus uh, eliminated this quadratic term up to this q prime two. Next, we would like to get rid of the source term, that is the first two terms in the right hand side. And we shall do so just solving the linear equation with uh, source term equals to such an expression. So let me call u up. The solution to the linear equation dt minus p of dx u up equals the source terms we had in the right hand side with a t equals one u up taken to be equal to zero. So of course this is a linear equation that we may solve without any difficulty. And so if we remove this u up from uh, uh, the left hand side of uh, our no linear equation. Well, we have eliminated the source term, and so we are left only with uh, the linear quadratic and cubic terms we had before. But now, what informations do we have on this u up? This will give us hints about uh, what estimates we should expect for uh, our solution. So this uh, u hat may be decomposed in several terms, so u prime up, u double prime up. And these terms have the following type of bounds when time is more than epsilon to the minus four. So first of all, recall that uh, in, uh, when I discussed the case of a nonlinear Fernand equation, I mentioned that it was important to have bounds on the L2 norm of some operator L plus acting on the solution. So here, let's make act L plus on uh, say U prime up. So we may prove that uh, this is bounded in L2 by T to the one over four times some expression. So this uh, reminds us of uh, the analogous estimate we had in the simple model of triangle equations, except that in that case, instead of having a power one over four, we, are, we had a power delta with delta small. The fact that we have one over four instead of a small delta is actually not that important. What is important is that uh, in the case of klein rodon this uh, t to delta was multiplied by epsilon, the size of the initial data. Here we get instead a factor, epsilon squared square root of t, which is small for t smaller than epsilon to the minus four, but which goes to one when t goes to epsilon to the minus four. And again, this is really the annoying factor and because of that factor that we are limited to times in epsilon to the minus four. So the other contribution of u double prime as uh, when we make act L plus on it, uh, not good estimate in L2, but good ones in L infinity, logarithm coins in L infinity, and we may uh, uh, handle it. What I would like to discuss a little bit more is uh, the point was bound that we may get for this u prime up. Actually, u prime up uh, of tx is bounded from above by, so if we forget, first of all, these large parentheses, we have something like epsilon square root of t, which is small for t is more than epsilon to the minus four, divided by square root of t. So this u prime up has a, a bound in uh, one over square root of t, up to time epsilon to the minus four, essentially, which is, which is the kind of binds we want. 
But this is the real, of course, when t goes to epsilon to minus four, a degeneracy. But actually, the term between uh, the parentheses here it tells you that you have something better than what I said. Let me explain that on a picture. On the picture, which is on the top of the screen, I have represented again two red dotted lines, which are the lines with the equation x plus or minus t square root of two thirds equals zero. If uh, we are outside the conical neighborhoods of these two half lines, so outside the pink uh, cones, then actually the whole parenthesis to the minus one is uh, bounded from above by t to the minus one half. So a power that compensates this square root of t, which means that outside these pink cones, we have a, a, a bound in epsilon square over square root of t, a nice bound like the one that holds true for Kirkland equations. That's on these two half lines that uh, we have uh, a relatively bad behavior. And actually I conjecture that when you go past the time epsilon to minus four that we are able to reach on these two half lines, I would not expect a one over square root of t bound, but nothing better than a log t over square root of t bound, uh, which is uh, uh, something that makes the problem completely different in that regime. So let me go back to my equation. So I recall you that I, re, I re subtracted from uh, our uh, initial unknown u plus a quadratic term and an approximate solution u up. So let me call u tilde plus this uh, a function and let me take it as a new unknown and let me rewrite it the problem in terms of this new unknown u tilde plus. So actually I will call also u tilde minus minus u tilde plus bar and I shall introduce the vector u tilde equals u tilde plus u tilde minus. And I shall write a system on u tilde instead of uh, an equation on u tilde plus. So when you express the system that was on the preceding, or the equation that was on the preceding slide in terms of this u tilde, you get the following uh, expression. You get capital DT minus a linear operator given by the matrix p of dx 0 0 minus p of dx minus some linear operator uh, depending on time acting on u tilde equals some cubic port that i call m3 m3 and some quadratic port that i call m prime 2 so in the preceding slide, uh, we had also in the right hand side, a linear contribution. But this linear contribution, I put it in the left hand side and it is now given by this V of T acting on U tilde. V of T is independent of U tilde. And more precisely, this V of T is actually uh, a matrix of linear operators whose entries are a few different operators of order zero. So we still are not done because uh, remember that uh, we want to commute to the linear part of the operator uh, an L plus, which was X plus TP prime of DX, or actually here for the second component of the system, an L minus, which is, e, which is X minus TP prime of DX. In other words, we want to commute to a star uh, the matrix uh, of operators L equals L plus zero, zero, L minus. So this matrix nicely commutes to capital DT minus uh, P of DX zero, zero minus P of DX. 
but it does not commute to the operator V of T. And so in order to overcome this difficulty, uh, we do a little bit what we have done at the very beginning. That is we construct a wave operator, except that this wave operator, C of T will now depend on time and will be constructed such that if we compose at the left uh, our uh, linear operator in the left hand side of star with C of T, we get at the right the same operator but where uh, the potential term V of T has been removed composed with C of T. So consequently, applying C of T to the system we had before, we obtain a new system for C of T u tilde, where we no longer have any potential term in the left hand side, and where in the right hand side, we still have a cubic and a quadratic contribution. So we are still uh, not done because uh, remember that what I said at the beginning was that uh, we wanted essentially to reduce ourselves to the model of uh, the kind of equation that I discussed, which was a model where the nonlinearity was just cubic and had a special structure. Models u tilde plus square u tilde plus, models u tilde minus square u tilde minus. And here, of course, this nonlinearity has not this structure. So there is still uh, another step to be performed, which is to use uh, space time normal forms uh, uh, um, using the terminology of Germain, Matmoudi, and Chata. That is to modify again, actually, the utilda, which is in the left hand side in order to eliminate uh, as much as possible of the right hand side and to be left finally only with non-linearities that have this special structure and that can be treated. And so once you have done all of that, you end up with proving uh, three inequalities which are inequalities of uh, the same type as the ones that I discussed uh, uh, in the model case, namely a Sobolev inequality with a bound in epsilon t to the delta for some small delta say, an L2 bound for L plus acting on u tilde plus, uh, which is of the same type as the one that we had for what I called u up earlier. So about in t to z one over four times something which remains small for t smaller than epsilon to minus four. And finally, this dispersive bound, uh, what is, which is really what we are interested in, namely a bound in one over square root of t times uh, uh, numerator that is uh, small when t is more than epsilon to the minus four. So in other words, we have uh, in that way obtained the decay estimate we wanted for what I call PAC phi at the beginning, that is the projection of the perturbation of our problem on the absolutely continuous spectrum. But remember that we had also an ODE that was coupled with our PDE. And so we have also to study that ODE. So that ODE was given by capital T square minus square over four A of T equals a nonlinearity, which depends on A of T and also on uh, uh, PAC phi, uh, the part of the solutions that we have studied in the preceding slides. And so what you want to do is to obtain for this A of t uh, decay in epsilon times one plus t epsilon square power minus one half. So it turns out that 
this is relatively classical, well, you, you may uh, uh, transform your uh, ODE into uh, an equivalent one, uh, over, uh, an equivalent one over the one. That may be written as capital DT G of T equals some complex number times modes of G of T squared G of T plus remainders. So you have a real part, alpha, which doesn't matter, and an imaginary part that de depends on some explicit expression, uh, y2 hat of square root of two. This is a free transform of some uh, explicit function at square root of two. And if you want that this ODE has a, a solution which is uh, defined for any positive time and which decays at the wanted rate, you need to know that this red term is strictly negative. This is the Fermi golden rule in the terminology introduced by Sofer and Weinstein on uh, uh, studies of similar problems in higher space dimension. And it turns out that this uh, Fermi golden rule holds. It has been checked uh, numerically by Kowalczyk, Marta, and Munoz uh, in their paper. But uh, it turns out that the function y2 at uh, of square root of two uh, may be, uh, well, well the, not the function, but the number, which is here, is given by an integral that may be computed explicitly by residues. And so we do have a, a mathematical proof of the fact that this Fermi golden rule uh, holds. And so because of that, this ODE has the wanted uh, decay for its solution. And this gives uh, uh, the second and last statement of the theorem. So of course, in practice, everything is coupled. So uh, things are uh, uh, a, bit, a little bit more complicated than what I said here. But I guess that now my, my time is over. And so I just have to tell you, Shishi.